Yeah, and uh, it's funny. Do you, do you think that um, there was something they saw in you? I mean, you mentioned that uh, you, know, you always surround yourself with good people, and that is what leaders do. Um, <laughs> leaders that think they have to do it all aren't really leading. They're um, exactly they're 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 dealing with something else and trying to be out in front. But uh, was that something that people had seen you that said, you know what, we need a this is a different leadership position, and here's someone that knows how to surround himself, or is it? Do uh, you think just random? I, I think I think they seen that in me. I mean, I I was a captain of my football and basketball team. Um, since I was a sophomore. So I always been a leader. I was a captain of my college football team. You know, I think there was something that people saw in me. Maybe I didn't see it and I just figured, okay, well, I'm a introverted type of person and um athletically I I guess I'm speak out loud. I, I don't know. But I, I think just people saw it in me and just felt like out of all the candidates that probably apply for that position, that it would be a natural fit for me. Yeah. And I and think that's what happened. Yeah. And, um, you talk about being, uh, named captain. Uh, is that mm -hmm. something that the, uh, that the players or is it the coaches or both that, uh, were over those different times that selected you? Who were the, what were the group that named you to that position as captain? You know what? I, I want to say it's my coach because most of the players, I, you know, me being so young, yeah, athletically I probably was um, above or on their level of the seniors, but I don't think just how kids are, I don't think they would have selected me. So I, I think it was the captains. I mean, excuse me, I think it was the coaches. And the coaches just saw something in me. And I appreciate them, and I thank them because, again, that that right there gave me uh, the self confidence that I have now to be able to to lead people older because that could be intimidating. You know, I came in in a position with coaches that been there over fifteen years, and yeah. I'm just a new kid off the block, just trying to change things. And we know people don't like change, but change is good. <laughs> yeah, change is the as they say it's the only constant, you know. Um, yeah, and, and yeah. It's, especially in sports, if you're standing still, you're not playing ball. I mean, I don't know what you're mm -hmm, doing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I I asked about uh, how you were named as captain because uh, this was my first season at the high school level, and I was a little surprised when the kids came around and said, "When do we vote for captains?" Captains. And I said, "You don't." You know, I'm going to pick them. And yeah. it was, again, and I actually didn't know how many I was going to pick. I thought I was going to pick two. I wound up picking four. But it was because mm -hmm. in those early, you, again, you see something, and they were all relatively quiet kids. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I definitely, uh, for my group, I, I chose strictly from sophomores because I felt that was, you know, something that really – they need to have to either, as you were saying, that's either going to be their last year playing or mm -hmm. they're, they're getting ready to move on to uh, varsity. So I think that's something that um, it's definitely not to, to vote is um, it, it. That's a different thing. That's a social, a different side yeah. of society that is not about leadership. Yeah. And, and it does take adults to say, no, I see something in this <clears> kid and this kid needs the role of captain as bad as we need this kid to be captain. Yeah. And so, you know, with that said, you know, you've got the leadership here. Um, I want to talk about how you went and um, dealt with your academic program because uh, you developed <clears throat> a zero tolerance policy. You mentioned again that uh, that's tough when all the parents know you from when you were a kid, and we can all go on and on about all the things we know yep. we did um, and why it's, mm -hmm. why you didn't. You know, you wish somebody would have looked the other way when you were a kid. But tell us mm -hmm. how you um, w about your zero tolerance policy and how you made it work without um, degrading the athletic program, yep. which unfortunately there is a societal backlash, like you say, hey, what are you doing? Yep. Yet making it um, be the strength of the athletic program. 
Well, well, Dave, um, what it was, and like you said, you read the Q and A from the Athletic uh, Management Magazine, where I talked about it. It was a program that I myself. Well, I pretty much came up with it myself. It was an idea of my own, and it was um, just to help the kids be better prepared for the future. You know, I, I, like we said, we, we want to speak. We want to listen to our elders because our elders already walked in these these footprints, these footsteps. So we want to make sure that, well, I want to make sure that they don't walk in the same path that I walked in. If I can help them from making mistakes you know, then I'm doing a good job. Um, so I created this program called the Academic Athletic Assistance Program. And what it is is <clears throat> uh, if a kid fails or an athlete fails a class, now it doesn't matter what the state rules or regulations are. You know, the, the state rules and regulations is the bare minimum. You know, uh, Long Branch... I wanted to make sure that I had stricter rules. You know, the word student athlete is really going to mean something because what a student athlete really means is you're failing a class and you're still eligible to play. What's the consequence to that? There's really none because um, the state regulations say it's okay. And then that, that F or that failure in that course for that one marking period could decline your grade from possibly finishing the year with a B to a low C. And and that, as you know, nationally, uh, the, uh, not clearinghouse, but the eligibility center's criteria is, is increasing. So right now the bare minimum was 2.0. Now it's 2.3. And the sliding scale on the SAT, you know. Um, so it's just getting tougher. You know, you got to have the 16 core courses. When I was in high school, you only needed nine. So there's a big difference. You only needed the nine core courses and a, a, a 700 flat to accept scholarships. Uh, my situation was, and I know I'm getting off a little bit, but uh, sure. my situation was I had the core courses, I had the GPA, but I just couldn't overcome that SAT score. And, yeah, 700 sounds low, and it, I guess it sounds easy, but it was a lot of kids in my in my conference, in my area, in my county, that was having trouble getting the 700 on the SAT. You know, if I would have had the 700 on the SAT, my life would totally would be different today, you know, to today. Um, but yet I'm here. Um, I had to take the long route. So I didn't want that for our athletes. So with that being said, I started looking at the marking periods. And I noticed that a marking period falls in every door in every season. And my thing was, okay, in the fall, it falls kind of late in the season. So I said, that that's enough time from September to late October. Uh, the kids should be, you know, well adjusted back into school. So if they fell a class, okay, I'm pulling you. That, you know, we have checkpoints every two weeks. But the checkpoints is just to notify the coaches to make sure they're sending out progress reports, make sure that they're uh, talking to their team and their athletes about their grades. You know, you got to always remind them, you know, it's like lifting weights, muscle memory. If you consistently talk about it, the kid, it is consistently being the kid's uh, mental. So uh, that's one thing. But at the end of the market period, if a kid fails, I pull those kids from that team. Now, <clears throat> Not only do I pull them, I make them participate in what we have a weight room program. So we're still there; they still fall under the athletic, quote unquote, athletic umbrella. So I can still follow. And if they don't, you know, show up to the weight room and still work out, because I'm not going to give up on the kids and say, "Hey, I'm pulling you. That's it. You're done. Go away." I'm going to pull you, and I'm going to still keep you around. So you're still a part of something, but if you don't show up, there's no way to work your way back onto that team. So that that's that's part of it. Uh, another part of the program is uh, we get out of school. Our school dismisses at one fifty, 
So from 150 to 230, when the teachers are con- contractually, contractually, the teachers are dismissed at 230. So from 150 to 230 is mandatory study hall for the athletes. So the population of the school can leave for the day, but the 300 or 400 some athletes we have for that season have to stay and report to the study hall. And if they don't report to the study hall, again, now I got to trust my coaches. So now it's integrity of the coaches that the kid shows up to practice late, has a pass. And if they don't have a, because we have extended homework club after the study hall. So I should have said that. So some kids have to stay for the, for our study hall and then go to a homework club, which is right after the study hall. That's from 2.30 to 3. Practices usually start at a quarter to 3, 2.45, 3 o'clock. So if a kid comes late and he has a pass, that coach is supposed to, you know, make sure that he attended the study hall. Because if he didn't, then the integrity of the whole program, you know, is down the drain and the kid you know, you know, once you give a kid a, a little bit, they're going to want a lot more because they don't understand life yet. Um, and then it's a bad situation for a coach when I have to address them. But yeah. um, I want to stop on that for a little bit, uh, Jason, because okay. um, I like two things there. Um, going back to the beginning, just how important it is to, again, not taking sports away because that is where they're in a supervised scenario. That is where they're mm-hmm. able, you know, we're able to do things for them. Mm-hmm. And I think not seeing that option, which, you know, now that I hear, I'm like, well, that's pretty easy. I mean, that would never have occurred to me personally that that was an option, but it's such yeah. a simple option, which I think is why people are fearful to uh, come down on the players that need Mm-hmm. That that wake up call for academics mm-hmm. because once you kick them off the team, it goes really south at that point. Oh yes, because that was the only reason they were coming to school in the first place, um, and that mm-hmm. was the only only carrot in front of them. But mm-hmm. going further with integrating your coaches into it as well, again that trust to be checking because um, I have definitely learned that um, athletic directors have way too much on their plate to do without mm-hmm. a team. It is it is literally impossible. Um, I think the way you described it at the beginning, at one point, uh, being an athletic director, you know, I don't know how many decades ago, for many it probably was just keeping literally uh, law and order on the courts was about all you could yeah. do. You know, it was logistical. And as more comes yeah. in, you have to rely on those coaches, which... Um, We'll be getting into shortly is that how do you get them to want your trust and to fulfill it um but uh, let's continue so in addition to the study hall and the homework club what other components are in your academic athletic program well i have a full-time guidance counselor athletic guidance counselor as well and this this individual uh, you know main job is to we have checkpoints like i said every two weeks his main job is to send out those emails, those blasts to the coaches. Uh, I meet with him weekly, so he gives me updates. So if I need to make visits, and I love talking to the kids. So I, I go out to one team practice at least once a day just to reiterate the importance of academics, uh, the importance of sportsmanship. You know, basically, Dave, you know, with no filter, I tell them, don't, don't embarrass us. Don't embarrass Long Branch. And, the, you know, the one thing that the kids will probably say is, oh, here comes Mr. Cooley. He's going to say that I rent my name. Because I let them know people are going to remember that name, the last name, and you're going to embarrass your family. You know, um, people today, my mom called me the other day, and she was like, oh, I was at the doctor's office. And I told them my name, and they said, oh, do you know Mr. Corley? And I use examples like that to the kids because everything that you do, they're going to remember, especially on the platform of high school sports, which is now almost, I could say, almost a, a million 